Welcome to the Brook Church Video Podcast. Our church's vision is to become real people, finding real hope in the real world. So we hope these messages will encourage you in your faith and help you grow as an authentic follower of Christ. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the Brook Church. If you're a guest, we want to say a special word of thanks. We hope that you feel right at home today. We hope that you'll enjoy this service, and if we can do anything or serve you in any way, please let us know. We want to ask you, if you are visiting today, to fill out that connection card that's included in the program today. It's the tear-off section. Fill that out. Let us know that you are here, and then place that in the offering plate when it's passed later in the service. Also, if you want to take some information home with you today, you can go out to the guest information area. We've got a gift bag we'd be glad to give you. You can take that home and uh, read up a little bit about our church. Um, that, that song, Lord Have Your Way in Me, is really the theme of today. You're in for a special treat. We have a guest speaker today, Mark Proger. Uh, Mark and his wife are missionaries to South Africa, and they're here in the States. They're in transition right now, and Mark is going to be speaking, kind of continuing in our sermon series through the Gospel of Matthew. He's going to talk about the cost of following Jesus. So, Mark, I want to ask you to make your way up here. And uh, this is his wife, Ceci. Ceci, please stand up. And uh, you may recognize them because, yeah, go ahead. You can clap. <clears throat> I was going to have you clap later, but if you're just going to go ahead and do it, that's okay. But you may recognize them if you're like our family. We have, at, during month of missions, we um, uh, offer magnets with pictures of our missionary families. We have their picture on a refrigerator right in our kitchen. We pray for them often. And we are really glad that they're here, that uh, the Lord has worked that out for them to be present with us. So now, let's give a much better welcome than that to Mark and Ceci. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Mike. What a, a neat church. You know, we just came to visit with Cindy and Andy a few years ago, and then you guys just jumped on us and loved us and adopted us. And we never even had like a meeting or asked for that. It was just this back and forth, and next thing you know, you guys were supporting us, and we sure appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we've been back in the States for a month. Um, I guess we left I guess we left about five weeks ago, or we landed about five weeks ago. So we've been running around, and now we're about to go on a trip that may go down as one of the biggest disasters in the history of family trips. We've, we've got to, listen to this, we've got to go to Florida, then Rhode Island, then across to Nebraska, then California, and then back to Texas. I don't know what we're doing. We have three children, so it could be it could be really neat, and it could be really, really bad. Probably it'll be a little of both, won't it? So um, it's funny. I, I was thinking how we see God as kind of mean. If we're really honest as Christians, we think God's kind of mean. He's always going to make us do the hardest thing, and um, it's, it's usually going to be kind of unpleasant, right? Well... When I was a kid, I grew up in the church, loved God, uh, really tried to follow God. And I was pretty convinced that one day, uh, he, because he's mean, he was going to make me marry someone that I wasn't attracted to and then move to Africa. So um, he only did one of those. Uh, you can try to figure out which one. But um, so I realized later I probably wasn't listening. Well, he probably said, no, I'm going to make someone else marry someone really unattractive and then move to Africa with you. So... Um, but that was a little hurtful. He had to wait till I had a strong enough heart to handle that re rejection from him. But um, okay, so here's what we're going to do to start, just so we c keep it real. I want everyone to stand up if you had a fight this morning so we can pray for you. Okay, no one's going to admit it, but come on. Sunday mornings, that's like the prime real estate in the week to have a fight, you know? You're all trying to get pious, and the next thing you know, everything's making you so annoyed, or your kid's slurping cereal, and um, I don't know. I don't know what the fights are about, but we've all had them. We didn't have one today. I don't. I mean, me and Ceci definitely didn't, and even with the kids, we didn't. Uh, okay, we have one. That's really honest. That's the most honest person in the room because we've all done it. Um, so let's go to Matthew eight eighteen through twenty two. We're like Mike said, we're continuing in this sermon series. You guys have been going through Matthew, and we're going to talk about the cost of following Jesus. It's a tough. It's a tough. Uh, a me tough message, but I hope it's a good one. I hope you. You're challenged this morning. Let me pray for us as we look at Scripture. Father, would you be present 
Lord, I can run off in all different directions, and some of them aren't your direction. So we ask that you would be present. Lord, even that you would uh, tame my tongue and that your spirit would be here to change our hearts and make us more into the image of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Matthew 8, 18 through 22. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. You were made to follow Jesus. From the time the sperm and the egg came together to form you, you were made to follow Jesus. That's, that's what your whole identity, that's who God created you to be as a follower of Jesus. In fact, you've never met a person that wasn't designed and made to follow Jesus. So, so we've got to figure out how to do that, right? Because that's what life's all about, is following Jesus. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor during World War II. He was a, a great man of God, actually a pacifist in his position on war, but became so disturbed and offended by what was going on that he made the decision to join a conspiracy to kill Hitler. And he, was, he ended up imprisoned. He was found out, ended up imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. He had a lot of incredible things to say about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. He ended up being hung, hanged, two weeks before Allied forces freed the concentration camp he was in. So the war was over, and he was still hanged and and died there in that concentration camp. But let me read you something he said. Listen very closely. He said, Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. You know, free things, free gifts can still be extremely costly. If someone gave you a, a house paid in full, full, it's a very big, costly gift, but it was free for you. So just because our salvation was free doesn't mean it's cheap. So we don't want to fall into thinking or treating our salvation as something cheap. So let's look at um, let's look at this passage a little bit in in the first verse. I'm sorry, in verse 20, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. This is actually a reference back to the Old Testament when the Messiah was predicted and prophesied he would come. He was called the son of man. In Daniel 7, 13 through 14, it says this. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And I want to stop and say, this is who we serve. Listen to this person. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is Lord of all. That's who we've been called to serve. He's not just a ticket to heaven. He's not just a a quick prayer to take out our fire insurance policy. He is all. He's Lord of all. He's over everything. I want you to notice a few things about Jesus he, he behaves in this little passage in a way that would seem rude to, to our American sensibilities, doesn't he? I mean, a lawyer comes up and says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, I love to evangelize. It's one of my gifts. It's something I do regularly. If someone said to me, I want to follow Jesus, 
I'd be like, great, let's talk and let's let's get into this. But Jesus response almost seems like off putting. He says. Foxes have dens and birds have their nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Now, I want to submit to you that he's not telling the guy to leave. He's just saying, hey, you say you want to follow me, but listen, this is the cost. If you follow me, you may not have a place to sleep tonight. We are, we are known to sleep in groves, in olive groves, or all the different places that Jesus and his disciples ended up. So when we follow Jesus, we're saying, we're not saying, Jesus, we've got all our plans. Would you come in and bless them? We're saying, Jesus, I put these plans aside. I follow you, and I only pick up the, back up the ones you told me to pick up. So he then has another guy say to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus tells him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Sounds, it sounds callous. I want to point out, though, that it's widely believed and understood that this didn't mean the guy's dad was dead waiting for the funeral in a few days. That's not what this passage means. He means, Lord, as soon as my parents die and go on, I can't wait to come back and follow you. So Jesus is responding to that statement. He's saying, don't worry about that. He's saying, follow me and, make, and let other people that aren't concerned with the most important things deal with that situation. So it's not as if, um, it's not quite as bad as it may sound or as it does sound to us. He's saying, just follow me and it's going to be okay. So I was thinking about some contemporary examples, some things that we might, the way that we might say the same thing. And it may be something like this. As soon as I get my retirement account to the right place, I'm going to go do that thing God called me to do. Or as soon as I'm comfortable, maybe I'll go do missions or maybe I'll start serving at the Brook Church when I can um, cut a few other things out of my schedule. I'm not saying that any of those things, those examples I gave are things that you actually are called to do. Please don't don't let me give you God's word in terms of what you're supposed to do. My point is. We make excuses in our life to not do the things that God's laying on our heart. I do. I hope you don't hear me pointing at you. I do. Um, Here's another lie. I'm not cut out for the really crazy stuff. That's other people. That's just not me. You know, when we uh, when we decided to go to Africa. It seemed crazy. We didn't we didn't we didn't know really what was going on. We looked at it. We saw this organization. We thought they seem really neat. But moving three children to Africa, Zila was two. I think they were two, four, and six were our children's ages. That's pretty crazy. And we sold, I don't know, I think we kept 10% of what we had. We sold most of what we had. And some things we put in storage at my in-law's house. And we got on a plane. And about 40 hours later, we were in Africa. Yeah, think about doing that with kids, right? Uh, it's funny now, a four or five hour drive is just nothing. Or a, or a four or five hour flight, that's like a short flight because we're used to 10 and 15 hour flights. So, um, but guys, we're not any different than you. We didn't, we didn't feel ready. We weren't like gunning for like some, the craziest thing we could do. So I want to tell you, maybe God's put something on your heart that it's like, it's just so crazy it might work. You know, that's that saying we always use. Maybe you're supposed to do something that keeps coming back to you. And you keep imagining, no, that can't be for me. That can't be for me. Maybe it's for you. So it's fine for us to have goals. But make sure that they're not eclipsing our desire to follow Jesus. Don't don't let your whatever um, goal you have with work or with your financial goals eclipse your desire to follow Jesus. Jesus may say, hey, you know, you normally put $2,000 in savings every month. This month, I want you to take that and do something extravagant with it. Give it to the building fund. Or, or this, there's a family over here that is two, two months behind on their rent. Why don't you go pay that for them? See what I'm saying? That, that kind of stuff. Are you willing to do those really practical but, but tricky things? By the way, by the time we got on that plane to go to Africa, we were very excited. Sometimes you step out in faith saying, okay, Lord, I think you're saying this. And then the Lord will meet you there. The Lord's good. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to be miserable. That's not the goal. And in fact, a lot of these things, have you ever thought about the people that go the furthest in life, whether it's a, you're watching the Olympics or 
Some of you will be watching the NFL today. You don't have to raise your hand. But um, those guys worked their tail off for years to get good enough to do the things they do. They, it's sacrifice. It's pain. Lots of, lots of pain. And yet they do it and they think it's worth it, don't they? And then think about your own life. The things that you look back on in your life, if you just raise the things you're the most proud of, I bet it's the things you worked the most hard on. Maybe it was your high school diploma. Maybe it was your college degree, a master's or a PhD. It's the things that took a lot of work, right? So Jesus is actually inviting us into this richer, fuller life, a life where we get to give it all to him. And as we follow him, we keep saying, oh, this was worth it. I can't believe I was scared of this. This was worth it. So you were made to follow Jesus. You were made to lay down everything and follow him and see where he leads you. So we couldn't have been saved without his his death and resurrection. We also can't experience the steady change unless we follow him. I think what what I found in my heart over and over is I have this list of rules, some bare bone things that I live up to. I won't. Um, I won't cheat on my wife. I won't get drunk. I mean, we have, I have these, you know, I'm not saying I actually write these down, but I have these rules. And then I measure myself by these rules and say, I'm doing pretty good. Go to church. And, um, but isn't it funny? Like Jesus calls us to something so much higher and so much better. That's just, that's like side stuff. Because you know what? When you're following Jesus, you're not cheating on your spouse. And when you're following Jesus, you're not, you see what I'm saying? The hard thing is the, the things that happen quick, like snapping out and like I can get so frustrated with my, my children and I adore them. But I can I can use harsh, too harsh of tone and too harsh of language when I'm correcting them. So let me um, if we get the picture up of me and my little girl in front of the Pantheon. So I'll tell you something. I'm not trying to sell you on missions, but one fun thing about missions is you do get to see the world. So we had some generous supporters give us miles to get back from Europe to America, but they're, because their airlines didn't go all the way to South Africa. So we had to fly to Europe. So I'm like, Sessie, pick a place in Europe you want to go, and we'll spend a few days there before we come home. be like a family retreat. So Sessie said Rome. And here we are in front of the Pantheon. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the Pantheon, the word itself tells you what it means if you can break down Greek. Pan is many. Theon is God. Pantheon is the place where many gods were housed. And the Romans had lots and lots and lots of gods, filling it up. So let's see the next picture. So that's us inside the Pantheon. It's, it's actually an incredibly beautiful building. But it was, um, in fact, it was co-opted later and used as a church once Christianity began to spread. But the Pantheon is filled with gods. And I think so many times what we do as Christians is we say, Lord, I'm going to put you in my Pantheon. And there's lots of other things in our pantheon. For me, UT football has got to be up there. I know you're making fun of us now, but uh, you just wait. Um, so you, I love UT football. I do. And um, so that's definitely one. I'm like, Lord, is that an idol in my life? Maybe it's the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money. Maybe it's um, your car or your house. You see what I'm saying? So I don't. I hate giving lists because I'm, I'm going to leave yours off. But, but let the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, what is it in your life? that you've just added into your pantheon and you've got Jesus sitting right there and you're like, well, I go to church, I give money to church and so I'm fine and then you do everything else. Now, please don't hear me saying that there's anything wrong with UT football. In the Greek, the word is metanoia, God forbid. May it never be. Um, So, um, no, my point is, is that when we follow Jesus, sometimes it may be, it may be laying something down, maybe for a season, maybe forever. Maybe if if alcohol is a struggle for you, maybe you stop drinking. Maybe forever. If that's something where you keep finding yourself going back to it and abusing it, maybe it's time to stop today and follow Jesus in that area. Um, Maybe it's food. I think that for a lot of us as Americans, I've had the Lord, been he's been working on my heart about gluttony. I'm like, I just eat whatever I want. I've got genes on my side that help me not get overweight, but that makes me no less gluttonous than the next guy, right? So I've been having the last few weeks, I'm like, what is gluttony and am I walking in gluttony? So, so can you let, can you invite the Lord? Remember, he's gentle. He loves us. Can you invite him to come and look at your heart and your life and just 
highlight areas and say, son or my daughter, would you lay that aside and let me let me love you well? I want to tell you um, a few years ago, actually it's been almost 20 years ago, I heard this man speak. And he told about going to India to where the Sisters of Mercy, Mother Teresa's orphanage was. And it was before she had died. And um, I believe it was before she had died. He was there for three weeks on a mission trip, American, 20, 21, 22, I don't know. And he goes to India. And if you've never been outside of America, uh, poverty in developing countries is shocking. You just can't imagine. The, the township that we worked at in South Africa, which South Africa is lovely. There's neighborhoods that look like you could be in Palm Beach, California. I mean, it's got big, beautiful homes, and it's got townships. And um, the township we worked in had 40,000 people living in one square mile and mostly in shacks without running water and without, um, well, they had electricity, no running water. So it's hard to imagine that. And yet we lived in the richest country in Africa. Of all 56 or 54 countries, we were in the richest one. People come to South Africa to, to make it. And so there's poverty across this world that you can't imagine. So this man was in India, in Calcutta, and he, he was working and serving. And about a weekend, one day, they said, who will take the trash out for us? No one volunteered. And he had this heart, like, I want to be here and serve. And he's like, that's weird. No one volunteered. So he volunteered. And if I remember correctly, they kind of prepared him for what he was about to experience. Now, let me tell you what's in the trash in the Sisters of Mercy in Calcutta, India. See, they bring people that are dying off the street. They shave their heads because their hair is oftentimes filled with lice. They throw their clothes away and they, they clean them up. The trash is horrifying. It's disgusting, okay? He takes the trash and he walks outside and he's met by a throng of people who try to get the trash away from him. And he doesn't speak their language. He's saying, no, no, please don't, don't. And they forcefully rip these trash bags away from him. They rip it open and they begin to shove whatever they can find that looks remotely edible into their mouth. Yeah, it's hard to decide if you should gag or cry, right? Um, So he's going, no, 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 no. And of course his words are, useless as they shove this into their mouth and why are they doing that because they're hungry and how do you tell someone who hasn't eaten in days that they can't eat whatever it is they're they're shoving in their mouth you really can't but here's where he brought the point home for me he said we as the american church we're like those those beggars in that we are shoving things into ourselves that are completely like that are a waste, that are not, we're not, we're not being satisfied. And then he went on to say, the Lord has laid out a banquet for us, a banqueting table with the finest foods available. Can you imagine if right before you went to some very expensive restaurant, you ate like three things of cotton candy and a box of Twinkies and, and downed a few Cokes? But that'd be crazy, right? Is there anything sinful about cotton candy? No, it's one of the best foods in the world. But but it's, not, but it's not what you would do before you're about to go eat lobster or filet mignon, right? That'd be crazy. But we do that because Jesus has invited us to follow him. And we're looking around and we're so distracted and we're following after so many other things. And I do it. I hope you hear me saying we over and over again. I'm not just, I'm not pointing at you. We look, we follow, we spend our money, our time, our energy, and our passion on so many other things, and we give Jesus our leftovers. In the Old Testament, they had what was called the first fruits offering. And when the harvest came in, they would give like the whole first wave of harvest to the temple, to the priest, to the, to the Le- Levitical priests. So there's a principle there for us. How are we giving Jesus the best of who we've got? The first part of our day, the, the last part of our day. I mean, the, the part of your day that you treasure. How are we giving him everything who we are. So I'm going to I'm going to cut through a couple of lies. I'm just going to bring them out that we have as Americans, because sometimes you have to hear them to go. Oh, yeah, I do believe that if you don't hear him, you don't even recognize that you're you're walking in it. So we think everything should be quick and easy. So whether it's fast food, you pull up, you say, da, 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 we want this, this, this. And then it takes about a minute to get to the next window. And then you're like waiting and 
gosh, they're taking forever. You order the whole meal and you're about to get it within like three minutes and you're kind of complaining, you know. I mean, we've done it, right? Most of us have done it at some point. Um, 22-minute plot lines on TV. If you watch a 30-minute show on TV, I think with all the commercials out, it's about 22 minutes. A big crisis rises and is solved by the time the show's over. That's how we like it, right? Quick and easy. The perfect temperature. Put the AC just like we want it. Always having that stuffed feeling when we're done eating. You know, the feeling that maybe when you were younger, it was just at Thanksgiving. But now it's like, well, just stuffed every meal. These are all things that aren't necessary. Like, they're fine. Nothing, and they're not, I'm not saying they're bad by themselves. But maybe we submit them, resubmit them to Jesus and say, hey, am I supposed to be stuffed every time I eat Jesus? Maybe not. So um, how about rejecting the American notion that you can do it by yourself, that you were meant to do it all by yourself? That'd be great because... God put us, God put you in this church, in the brook, to be a part of a body and to serve each other and to open up about your sin struggles. Guys, get in groups of three or four or five or six and confess the things that we're struggling with because we know we're struggling with them. Women, same thing. Let's get together and and talk about the things we struggle with because if we're going to get to the end of sin, we've got to talk about it. How about following Jesus every day and look, maybe just today at some point, you could just write down, what are the things that I just think are my right? When I do that, I come up with, well, I already mentioned UT football. I also come up with things like watching TV. I just feel like it's like my right to watch like an hour a day, right? Because golly, I've read average Americans watches seven hours of TV a year. I don't remember the number, but some. So I only watch an hour, so I'm better than them. Who said the goal was just to be better than average? That's not the goal. The goal is to follow Jesus. So why am I, like, settling for so much less? Why am I settling for cotton candy and Twinkies right before a lobster dinner? So how do, what do we do with our time? What are our hobbies? How do we spend our money? Um, I had this, I wrote this silly story in my mind I want to share with you. Go back to junior high. And let's imagine you're in junior high and you're at an awkward stage. Maybe you just, well, we were all there. So just imagine whatever that looked like for you, Okay. By the way, not all junior hires are awkward. Some junior hires are incredibly not awkward. But wherever your awkward stage was, okay? Now, imagine that you're getting picked on. People are making fun of you. And, um, and you say, oh, yeah, well, my big brother is so strong, he can bench 300 pounds. And he's huge. And he's, a, you know, a football player. I don't know what. Just roll with this, ladies, on my, um, in my example. It's very uh, male-esque in this point. And they're making fun of you. And then let's say that your big brother is actually Dwayne Johnson, the rock. Okay? He really is. But no one knows this. And they don't believe you. And you don't tell them that because he's just your big brother. And they're picking on you one day after school. And, and Dwayne Johnson shows up. I mean, that guy's huge. He's, like, looking good, big, mass, massive guy. And suddenly, all your friends are like, whoa, that's really your big brother? And everything changes. And you're, you, what do you feel in my little goofy, really goofy story? You feel kind of proud. Like, yep, that's my big brother. Guys, as silly as my example is, can you imagine a million times over, that's how we're going to feel when Jesus shows up. A, a billion times over. There is no way to begin to imagine how incredible it's going to be when Jesus shows up. And every person that, that raised their fist at him to mock him or flicked him off or, or made, made fun of him on television shows, or mocked the very notion that there's a God, much less that he would come in the form of a human, they're all going to fall on their knees. Because it says that every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? In Philippians 2, it says that everyone, so every one of us, everyone you've ever met, every person you've ever seen mock the very notion of God, they are going to fall on their knees and they're going to worship Jesus. And they're either going to be doing it out of only fear or they're going to be doing it out of love and adoration. That's what he's invited us into. That's the relationship he's invited us into. And can you imagine like how we'll think about the times when we were tempted to be ashamed of our faith? When we didn't want to mention anyone that we love Jesus or that we were we were called by his name whether it's at school or work or or now with with issues that are spinning around in society right now. I mean, let's be honest. It's a really hard time in history 
to say that you think it's wrong to be gay. And that's just one sin. I don't mean to pick on that. But just right now, for obvious reasons. And I don't mean you have to volunteer that either. By the way, if when I'm reaching out to people, whatever their sin is, I don't lead with, oh, by the way, <laughs> you shouldn't be sleeping with your girlfriend. That, I don't do that. Like, but my point is, is that if someone asks you, are you willing to say, yeah, you know what? I do think that's wrong. But I struggle with sin, too. I mean, in a humble way, are you willing to share the truth with people, people that don't know the truth? Are you willing to tell them, I think God has a better way? What about instead of focusing on why or how it's wrong, saying, yeah, I think that's wrong, but because God has something so much better for us. Just a thought. Let me, um, I, I was thinking um, when, when Jesus comes, he's going to be the one that Daniel describes And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Are we living for his kingdom? Are we living to advance his kingdom, his purposes? Or have we made a bunch of like deals with God? God, I'll go to church. I'll give a little money. But but Sunday afternoon is mine or for me saturday afternoon is mine or my evenings i get to watch tv like i'm not saying we ever actually say this but how do we live our lives do we live it in a way that just shows compromise all over the place i do Uh, oftentimes that's the the painful truth is that i see that in my life um guys I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to heap condemnation on us. Do you know the difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation is what Satan uses to push you away from God. The conviction is the Holy Spirit touching your heart and saying, come here, my child. And it's drawing you to him. Okay, so, so they can look alike. They can look real similar, but they're worlds apart in their, their, what they really are, their effect, their fruit. So what I'm asking is that we, in, is that we say, Lord, would you touch my heart? Would you bring conviction? Where is it that I'm just miss? I've just been missing it. I want to follow you. A lot of us just need to regularly say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you again. I want to stop running after all the other things that I've been worried about. When you think about getting to the end of life and standing before God, can you imagine ever thinking, oh, oh I should have watched more TV? Or, or, Oh, man, I should have slept more. Okay, some of you probably should have slept more. (laughs) That's not a good example. Um, Or I should have worried more. There were so many more things to worry about. I didn't even think about it. Good night. No, right? When I say it that way, it's so silly. And yet we do that, right? How about, um, um, oh, I should have bought more things. Life would have been so much better if I had bought more things. Or if I had had a nicer car or a bigger house. or None of those things. It's not bad to have a nice car or a big house. But you see what I'm saying? Do you see how we can get our priorities all whacked out? They're all upside down. So all I want us today is to ask, Lord, what are the best, what are the best things that you're calling me to? How are you calling me to follow you? It's the, he wants to give us the best. He wants to give you the best stuff. He wants to give you that banqueting table I described, not, not the, the trash filled with refuse, just settling for so much less than he has for you. And are you willing to lay down your struggles, your sin struggles? Are we willing to <clears throat> come into the light with other people, with brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, and say, man, this is an area I'm really struggling, and just be open about it and begin to get help? Because we all have that stuff, guys. There's no, there's no question. We've all got stuff that we're just still walking, we're walking in. So being a Christian, you know this, isn't, doesn't mean you're sinless or perfect. It's actually just being really real and broken and following Jesus in that place of brokenness, following behind the one who is perfect and who does have it all together and who, who will lead us. I um, can't remember if I've already said it this service, but, but we only get anywhere we're going in life because we follow a really good leader. Jesus is the good shepherd, and we're sheep, which are not the most intelligent animals. They wander off. They do really dumb things. So, okay, let me, let me pray for us.